take an angle, Neil. The laser reflector. They're open, and it looks like they're going to stay up without any problem. Columbia, Columbia, this is Houston. We're about to lose you on the Omnis. Request high gain antenna. React mode. Pitch two zero. Yaw one three five. Over. I'm gonna pick an area, Neil. Make that yaw one seven five. Columbia, yaw one seven five on the high gain. Roger out. The surgeon says everything looks fine. An hour and a half of lunar surface time for Neil Armstrong. They've been on the portable life support systems for two hours now. And the manual uh, deployment of the uh, LR cubed uh, That's Neil Armstrong to the left of the screen. By that doors are closed and locked. Okay. Have you got us a good area for down? Well, I think right out on that rise out there is probably as good as any. Yeah. 
these uh, quite rounded, large boulders. Buzz Aldrin coming into view on the right, carrying the two experiments. About 40 feet out, I'd say out to the end of that next... Uh... Well, it's going to be a little difficult to find a good level spot here. Uh, top of that next little ridge there, isn't that, would that be a pretty good place? And they will be out of the camera's field of view while setting up these experiments. Houston, I have the, uh, the seismic experiment uh, over now, and I'm aligning it with the sun. I'm having a little bit of difficulty getting the beef going to center. wants to uh, move around and around on the outside. Oh, you're cutting out again, boys.
is on a leveling device on the uh, passive size monitor. Neil, this is Houston, over. Thank you. 
Uh, two, 212 is the time expended on the uh, PLSS. This is Houston. If you're still in the vicinity of the PSC, could you get a photograph of the ball level? Over. I'll, I'll do that, sir. Houston, uh, we're estimating about 10, 10 minutes for the document sampling, over. Columbia, Columbia, this is Houston, over. Terminate charging battery Bravo at uh, 111 plus 15, over. Buzz, this is Houston. Uh, you've got about 10 minutes left now prior to commencing your EVA termination activities. Over. Tranquility Base, this is Houston. The Pathia Seismic Experience has been uncaged, and we're observing short period oscillations in it. Over. Armstrong has been on the surface now about an hour and 50 minutes.
In the foreground, Buzz Aldrin is collecting a core tube sample. I hope you're watching uh, how hard I have to hit this into the ground uh, to the tune of about five inches, Houston. Roger. The core tubes provide material. Get the next one. Maybe you can get, turn away the box a little bit. I'll take care. Buzz, this is Houston. You have approximately three minutes until you must commence your EVA termination activities. Over. Roger, understand. Columbia, this is Houston. Approximately one minute to LOS. Over. And one minute. And do you plan on uh, commencing your sleep on the back side this path? Uh, if so, we'll disable uplink to you while we're talking to the LAM. Over.
Buzz Aldrin retrieving the solar wind experiment. Uh, Buzz, this is Houston. It's about time for you to start your EVA closeout activities. Roger. They've been on their life support system. On their life support systems, two hours and twenty-five minutes. Neil appears to be picking up rocks to the right of the screen. Neil and Buzz, this is Houston. I'd like to remind you of the close-up camera magazine before you start up the ladder, Buzz. Keep a good margin in those portable life support systems.
that white dot right above the horizon on the right is a phosphorus spot from the TV converter in the park station in Australia. Neil's been on the surface a few minutes longer than two hours. Buzz, uh, approximately 20 minutes less than that. Uh, Neil, this is Houston. Did the Hasselblad magazine go off on that uh, sample return container also?
Transferring the sample containers into the limb cabin now. Uh-oh. Camera came off. I mean, the film bag came off. The Lick Observatory in California reports a return on the laser. Hey, and Bugs, for your information, your consumables remain in good shape, Bob.
Okay, I'll get it the rest of the way. Okay. And I'll give it to you to uh, go away in just a second. hours 40 minutes on the PLSS's. Unofficial time off the surface at 111.37.32. Uh, uh, start arching your back. That's good. Plenty of room. Here, I'm right. Arch your back a little. Your head up again. Your plant antenna suit. Okay, seed water valve closed. Yeah, your antenna suit. This is Houston, go ahead. You're cutting out, Neil. Uh, you're not readable. I uh, understand you said something about a contingency sample container on the uh, SN engine. Reading you, Neil. Buzz, buzz. This is Houston. Do you read over? Uh, tranquility base. This is Houston. We're reading neither one of you, but standing by.
cabin pressure coming up uh, about 2.789 pounds. Up to three now. Four PSI now. Show the cabin at four point eight now. I used to follow that one. Uh, when you look 
digging, the uh, tendency seems to be to pull the limb down toward uh, uh, the center of the moon as in a gravity gradient experiment. Uh, Roger, 11, we copy. Or it may have something to do with mass guns, or may. Uh, Roger, we've got uh, uh, it may have something to do with mass guns, or it may just be the peculiarity of the disk you display. Okay, we've observed the behavior of your disk. Uh, I think we've got the data here to work on it. Uh, let us grind around a little while on it, and we'll report back to you uh, uh, probably in a rev or two. Okay, well, in the meantime, I'm going to pitch down uh, toward 315. Roger. Three craters, three horizontal craters now I have in the field of view are uh, immediately underneath the ground track. The right hand and the largest crater that you see is uh, to the Agro P. Uh, Roger, we concur on the identification of that crater. <laughs> Coming up on uh, landmark Alpha One here shortly. Roger, uh, Mike's having his first look at Alpha One at the present time. Yeah, it's a great uh, bright crater. It's not a large one, but an extremely bright one. It looks like a very uh, recent, and I would guess, impact crater with. Uh, Ray screaming out in all directions, which uh, should make uh, Smythe, or the correction, the foaming sea easy to see coming up on it. Now, uh, Bayer Camp is one of the smaller ones out on the uh, on the floor of the foaming sea. Okay, we show you uh, over the, the sea of fertility now, and uh, you ought to have Langrenus uh, down south of the track a few degrees, about uh, nine degrees south of the track. Yeah, the crater that's in the center of the screen now is uh, Webb. Uh, we'd be looking straight down on it at about six minutes before power descent. It uh, has a relatively flat bottom uh, to the crater, and you can see maybe uh, two or three uh, craters that are in the bottom of it. On the uh, western wall, the wall that's now nearest to, to the uh, camera, or near the bottom of the screen, we can see uh, a temple crater just on the outside. And then coming back toward the bottom of the screen and to the left, you can see uh, a, a, a depression. Uh, it's the type of uh, connected craters that uh, give us most uh, interest to uh, discover why they're in uh, the particular patterns that they're in. I'll zoom the camera in uh, and try and give you a little closer look at this. Roger, we're uh, observing the Dimple Crater now. Uh, the central peak that we can see on the orbiter photos doesn't seem to stand out very well here. Well, they're not central peaks, they're uh, depressions in the center. Right. And you'll notice on the uh, pitch thruster activity, I, still, I put in uh, a dozen uh, minimum impulses and pitch down, uh, and I'm still far from correcting back to 315. We're moving the camera over to the uh, right window now to give you uh, language. It's, uh, it's uh, several central peaks. and. Uh, Roger. Uh, we got Langrenus in our screen now. Uh, 
Okay, 11, this is Houston. Uh, we're getting a beautiful picture of uh, Langrenus now with its uh, rather conspicuous central peak. In the right hand portion of our screen right now, we can see Messier, Alpha, and Bravo with uh, the light colored rays uh, streaming off in one direction. Okay, 
Okay, this is uh, very close to ignition point for power defense. Uh, just passing Mount Maryland, that's uh, a triangular shaped mountain that you see in the uh, center of the screen at the present time with the crater Seki Sita uh, on top of the far northern edge of the mountain. Roger, we're getting a uh, good. Now we're looking at uh, what we call Boot Hill. Curves 20 seconds into the descent. The uh, bright sharp rear at the very right edge of the screen.
Anything U.S. real is the one that was referred to in Apollo 10 as Sidewinder. Good name, too. Sidewinder Diamondback. Looks like a couple of snakes down there in the lake bed. the Terminator now. I see the uh, uh, contrast increase and only the sunlit side of the bridges uh, remain illuminated while the dark sides in the shadow will become completely black. Uh, 11, this is Houston. The picture is getting a little grainy now. You might go ahead and uh, open up the f-stop. Oh, yeah, that's about 
you got. I know there's uh, a lot of scientists from uh, a number of countries standing by to see the litter samples, and uh, we thought you'd be interested in seeing that they really are here. Uh, these two boxes are the sample return containers. They, they are vacuum packed uh, containers that were closed in a vacuum on the litter surface. And then uh, brought inside the lab and put inside uh, these fiberglass bags, zippered and resealed around the outside, around the outside, and placed in these uh, receptacles in the side of the command module. These are the two boxes, and uh, as soon as we uh, get onto the ship, I'm sure these uh, boxes will immediately be uh, transferred uh, and uh, delivery started to the litter receiving laboratory. Uh, these boxes include the samples of the various types of rock, the uh, ground mass of the soil, the sand and silt, and uh, the uh, particle collector for the solar wind experiment and uh, the corches that took uh, depth samples of the linear surface. Uh, Roger, Neil. Thank you much for that description. Uh, we've got a pretty dark picture down here. Could you check your F-shot? A little bit over. Okay, our monitor showed that to be very bright. Right. Uh, we're, we're down around uh, between, well, around F4, which we thought would be plenty light. Uh, we'll lighten it up some more. Well, we'd appreciate it. It's uh, pretty dark, dark on all our monitors here. Okay, fine. That's looking a lot better now, Neil. There's Buzz. Houston, we have an excellent picture now, over. Yeah, how do you read me, Charlie? Uh, five by now, Buzz, over. Okay. Uh, more mundane affair, not as successful though, and I'd like to see what's taking place in the uh, food department. I'm sure you've always type of a uh, drink container. A little later, Mike will show you how the uh, water gun uh, operates with its new uh, filter to take out the uh, hydrogen. Essentially, this uh, water gun is put in, in this end and filled up this bag with water, and the uh, drink then uh, dissolves in the water, and uh, this end of the mouthpiece.
being. Uh, likewise, we have uh, other foods that are more solid nature. You can probably see this uh, cocktail meal. Houston, uh, both you're breaking up badly. Yeah, uh, uh, Will you check your box over? All right, sir. How am I coming through now, Charlie? All right, yeah, you're very clear when you come through. It's just that your box is not uh, keying at uh, every word. Over. Okay. These bite size uh, objects were designed to uh, uh, remove the problem of having so many crumbs floating around in a cabin. So they designed uh, a particular size that uh, would be able to uh, go into the mouth all at once. I think since uh, all of our experience, we've discovered that we can uh, progress a good bit further than that back to uh, some of the type meals that uh, we have on Earth. As a matter of fact, on this flight, we've carried along pieces of bread. And uh, along with the bread, we have uh, a uh, ham spread. And I'll show you, I hope. How easy it is to spread some ham. Five minutes zero G. that uh, it is quite easy to Houston, we notice your roll rate increasing. Uh, would you please uh, see if you can uh, bring that uh, down to about zero for us, so we'll be losing a high gain shortly. Over. You can also use uh, zero gravity to demonstrate uh, many things that we've all learned in school. I'd like to demonstrate uh, briefly uh, how easy it is to explain the action of a gyroscope. Uh, if I spin this pan, we know that uh, according to the uh, equations of uh, uh, motion that we would expect that if once this is given a spin about, and has a spin axis in this direction, if we give it a particular torque, and if I, I'll do this by pushing my hands against it in this fashion once it's spinning, by the equations we can predict that as I put this torque on it, it will in fact rotate this direction. Let's see how work well this works out. And as I apply the torque this way, it rotated this way. He says, pretty good demonstration. Houston, this next is a little demonstration for the kids at home, all kids everywhere for that matter. Uh, I was going to show you how you drink water out of a spoon, but I'm afraid I fill the spoon too full and... Uh, if I'm not careful, I'm going to spill water right over the side. Can you can you see the water flapping around in the top of the spoon, kid? That's 
affirmative, 11. Okay, well, I, as I say, I was going to show you, but I'm afraid I filled it too full and it's going to spill over the side. i tell you what, I'll just, I'll just turn this one over and uh, get rid of the water and start all over again, okay? Okay. And you can see up here we know where over is. It's, uh, one uh, up is as good as another. That really is water, though, I'll show you. That's really not the way we drink. We really have a water gun, which I'll show you. There's the water gun. That cylindrical thing on the end of it is a uh, filter with uh, several membranes. One allows uh, water to pass, but not any gas. The other allows gas to pass, but not any water. So by routing uh, the gaseous water, which comes from our uh, tank, through this filter, we're enabled to uh, drink purified water without the gas in it, filtered water. And, uh, of course, all we do to, uh, to get it started is just pull the trigger. Sort of messy. I haven't been at this very long. It's sort of the same system that the Spaniards used to drink out of wine skins at bull fights. Only I think it would be more fun. Well, I'll be seeing you, kids. Uh, thank you from all the kids in the world uh, here in the Moker who uh, can't tell the earth from the moon. All right, just stand by one and we'll get you that earth for you. Okay, uh, yeah, 11, Houston, I have a picture now. Uh, that's primitive. I refuse to bite on this one, though. You tell us. Okay, this uh, should uh, be getting larger, and uh, if it is, it's uh, the place we're coming out to. Right there. No matter where you travel, it's always nice to get home. We concur, Levin. We'd be happy to have you back. It's Apollo 11, signing off. This is the commander of Apollo 11. A hundred years ago, Jules Verne wrote a book about a voyage to the moon. His spaceship, Columbus.
Columbia, took off from Florida and landed in the Pacific Ocean after completing a trip to the moon. It's appropriate to us to share with you some of the reflections of the crew as the modern day Columbia complete its rendezvous with the planet Earth in the same Pacific Ocean tomorrow. First, Mike Collins. Roger, this trip of ours to the moon may have looked to you simple or easy. I'd like to assure you that that has not been the case. The Saturn V rocket, which put us into orbit, is an incredibly complicated piece of machinery, every piece of which works flawlessly. This computer up above my head has a 38,000 word vocabulary, each word of which has been very carefully chosen to be of the utmost value to us, the crew. This switch, which I have in my hand now, has over 300 counterparts in the command module alone, this one single switch design. In addition to that, there are a myriad of circuit breakers, levers, rods, and other associated controls. The SPS engine, our large rocket engine, on the aft end of our service module, must have performed flawlessly or we would have been stranded in lunar orbit. The parachutes up above my head must work perfectly tomorrow or we will plummet into the ocean. We have always had confidence that all this equipment will work and work properly, and we continue to have confidence that it will do so for the remainder of the flight. All this is possible only through the blood, sweat, and tears of a number of people, the American workmen, who put these pieces of machinery together at the factory. Second, the painstaking work done by the various test teams during the assembly and the retest after assembly. And finally, the people at the Manned Spacecraft Center, both in management, in mission planning, in flight control, and last but not least, in crew training. This operation is somewhat like the periscope of a submarine. All you see is the three of us, but beneath the surface, are thousands and thousands of others. And to all those, I would like to say thank you very much. This is Houston. We're getting a good picture of Buzz now, but no voice modulation. And would you open up on the, the TV camera? Uh, try a tutu, please. That appears to be a lot better now. We're still not receiving Buzz's audio. Good evening. I'd like to discuss with you a few of the more symbolic aspects of the flight of our mission Apollo 11. As we've been discussing the events that have taken place in the past two or three days here on board our spacecraft, we've come to the conclusion that this has been far more than three men on a voyage to the moon. More still than the efforts of a government and industry team more even than the efforts of one nation. We feel that this stands as a symbol of the insatiable curiosity of all mankind to explore the unknown. Neil's statement the other day upon first setting foot on the surface of the moon, this is a small step for a man, but a great leap for mankind, I believe sums up these feelings very nicely. We accepted the challenge of going to the moon. The acceptance of this challenge was inevitable. The relative ease with which we carried out our mission, I believe, 
is a tribute to the timeliness of that acceptance, of accepting expanded roles in the exploration of space. In retrospect, we have all been particularly pleased with the call signs that we very laboriously chose for our spacecraft, Columbia and Eagle. We've been particularly pleased with the emblem of our flight, depicting the U.S. Eagle, bringing the universal symbol of peace from the Earth, from the planet Earth, to the moon, that symbol being the olive branch. It was our overall crew choice to deposit a replica of this symbol on the moon. Personally, and reflecting the events of the past several days, a verse from the Psalms comes to mind to me. When I consider the heavens, the work of thy fingers, the moon and the stars which thou hast ordained, what is man that thou art mindful of him? The responsibility for this flight lies first with, with history and with the giants of science who have preceded this effort. Next to the American people, who have, through their will, indicated their desire. Next to four administrations and their congresses for implementing that will. And then to the agency and industry team that built our spacecraft. The Saturn, the Columbia, the Eagle, and the little EMU, the spacesuit and backpack that was our small spacecraft out on the lunar surface. We'd like to give a special thanks to all those Americans who built those spacecraft. We did the construction, the design, the test, and put their their heart and all their abilities in, into those crafts. To those people, tonight we give a special thank you. And to all the other people that are listening and watching tonight, God bless you. Good night from Apollo 11. Eleven, this is Houston. We're getting a zoom view out the window now.
guidance reports both navigation systems on Eagle are looking good. Houston, now you're looking good at two ping zags and missed in all of three. Ritter off there. And there it is. 
is right there. And there she said. Man, that's impressive looking at her. All three data sources are agreeing quite closely here. The three color plot board on the front of mission control here is almost uh, superimposed as each of the three colors are scribed on the scribing plotter. Eagle Houston, uh, you're still looking mighty fine.
Houston, I do let him wait for you whenever you're ready to copy.
Columbia, and Nathaniel are doing the league check. Uh, missed anything after that? 